Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a sensational interview with Dr. Chris Martinson of The Crash Course and PeakProsperity.com. Chris gives a stern warning to those who are becoming complacent and don't seize on the opportunity to become more self-reliant and self-sufficient during this calm before the storm and what appears to be an inevitable economic reset. Don't miss my conversation with Chris Martinson coming up after this week's market update. Gold and silver markets consolidated this week with both metals reacting to jobs numbers on Thursday. The ADP report showed private sector employers added 253,000 new jobs last month on a seasonally adjusted basis. The apparent strength in employment lifted the U.S. dollar and sent gold and silver modestly lower until they've rebounded today. As of this Friday recording, gold is up now 0.7% for the week to bring spot prices to $1,277 an ounce. Silver trades at $17.52 and is up this week by 0.6%. The platinum group metals are diverging sharply with platinum down 0.9% to $954 an ounce, while palladium is up $50 an ounce or 6.3% to $843 as of this Friday morning recording. Should it close there, it would be the highest we've seen the industrial metal since September of 2014. On Thursday, President Donald Trump announced his plans to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement. Trump's decision outraged so-called environmentalists and clean energy proponents. But it won't slow the growth of solar and other alternative forms of energy. Government subsidies for solar power aren't going away. And market forces continue to drive costs down for solar panels and lithium-ion batteries used for storing solar-generated electricity and powering electric vehicles. Platinum prices have suffered on fears that rising sales of electric vehicles will reduce the need for catalytic converters, which are one of the main sources of platinum demand. The upshot is that lower platinum prices, punctuated by a historically low platinum to gold ratio, are making platinum more attractive for use in jewelry. According to Platinum Guild International, platinum demand for jewelry grew 11.4% in India and 5.4% in the United States last year. Meanwhile, lithium has been one of the hottest commodities of all, with spot prices nearly tripling over the past couple of years. Unfortunately, there is no practical way for investors to own physical lithium. The battery element doesn't even trade on a futures exchange. Those looking for a similarly obscure metal with similarly explosive upside potential do have the ability to own rhodium in physical form. Money Metals sells pure rhodium bars produced by Baird & Company of London. The bars come in a tamper-proof package to ensure authenticity. The primary use for rhodium is in catalytic converters for cars and trucks. It is alloyed with platinum and palladium to enhance resistance to corrosion. Rhodium is also used in some types of jewelry. Rhodium is scarce, thinly traded, highly volatile, and little known even among metals investors. But if upside potential is what you're after, rhodium has quite a history. From 2004 to 2008, Rhodium launched from $500 per ounce to as high as $10,000. Prices then proceeded to collapse back under $1,000. Rhodium currently checks in at around $950 per ounce. Clearly, this metal is more on the speculative side. Most investors will find that silver is more suitable for a core position while still offering tremendous upside potential in its own right. Silver is both a precious metal and an industrial metal with ever-increasing applications in computer technology, biotechnology, and energy technology. Silver is a small but critical component in the manufacturing of solar panels. Silver is also used in the electronics of all automobiles, regardless of whether they have gasoline or battery-powered engines. Batteries represent a potential area for huge demand growth in silver. Silver oxide and silver zinc batteries are viable alternatives to lithium ion. Silver-based batteries are actually superior in terms of their energy to weight ratios, but are currently more expensive to produce. High-tech demand for silver will continue as high-tech applications grow. Silver is indispensable due to its unique reflective and conductive properties. When you hold a silver coin, round, or bar in your hand, 
you're literally holding a form of stored energy. It never depletes or dies or needs recharging. The intrinsic value of silver is yours to unlock today, tomorrow, or decades from now, when there's no telling what new sources of high-tech demand may be driving market prices. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Dr. Chris Martinson of peakprosperity.com and author of the book, Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. Chris is a commentator on a range of important topics such as global politics, financial markets, governmental policy, precious metals, and the importance of preparedness, among other things. And it's always great to have him with us. Chris, welcome back and thanks for joining us again. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be with you today, Mike, and all of your uh, listeners. Well, since this is actually the first time we've had you on in uh, 2017, Chris, uh, to get started here, I'd, I'd mm -hmm. like to have you set the stage for us uh, because many of us continue to be confused and bewildered by the resilience of these markets. So first off, give us your thoughts on the first 130 days or so of, of Trump's presidency, and then how is it that the U.S. equities market continues to soar to new heights despite what appears to be massive overvaluation. Basically, assess for us what's going on in the political and financial markets here during the first half of the year as we start off. All right. Well, I love how you set that up because they're actually coincident in my mind. The first four months of 2017, we saw something that has never been seen in world history, and that was central banks across the uh, globe creating a trillion dollars of new hot money. So if you want to know anything I think about the markets, we have to start with 250 billion thin air hot money base currency units being created and tossed into the financial systems. That, that really uh, is a large explanation factor. And of course, there was this idea that uh, Trump was coming in and that this could put a, some sort of a fresh air kind of a, a scene here. But let's be clear. Trump was a surprise victory there, and at about 2.30 in the morning with the Dow down 800 points, it rallied and got back to green by open, and uh, no question in my mind but that that was uh, official action, the plunge protection team or somebody like that. And, and so I think that's the world we're in now, really. That's my setup. The macro setup is the authorities are dumping huge amounts of money into markets to get them to go higher. They're also making sure that markets can't go down uh, at any point. And, and they do what they can. My view is they'll do that until they can't. And then it will break and it'll be very surprising for a lot of people. Expanding the point here, Chris, lately we have been addressing the exhaustion that some bullion investors are feeling that they have spent mm -hmm. the past decade watching as the growth in government debt has accelerated, something you've been following and documenting for years all the way back to your amazing uh, crash course presentation, which really opened my eyes when I first consumed that amazing material. The Fed and other central banks have, have abandoned all restraint, zero interest rates, monetizing treasury bonds and mortgage securities and other exotic programs. The federal government has been running massive deficits for even longer, for half a century at least. But none of this, to this point anyway, has seemed to matter. The U.S. dollar appears to be holding up. The bond vigilantes have never shown up. Stock prices are, are making all-time highs, and no one on Wall Street seems to be interested in, in buying safe haven assets. Now, the upcoming webinar that you're going to be doing here very soon, and we'll get into those details later in the podcast, is titled The End of Money, and you will be making the case that, that these fundamentals do, in fact, matter. Talk for a minute about what you see developing and why you think safe haven investors just need to stay the course despite what appears to be a punishing environment. Well, I'd love to. You know, you have to have a macro view at a time like this. There's no other way to explain when you're in the middle of the largest money printing experiment, and I use that word carefully, in all of human history. So, you know, to, to try and think that what guided us in the past is going to be useful during the most extraordinary money printing of ever, of all time, is, is I think, misguided. So what do we do with that? Well, I think we have to understand how much is being printed, what that actually means, what it really tells us about what the Fed is thinking, what, how scared they are. You know, listen, you've got your chips on one side of the table or the other. Either they know exactly what they're doing, and they've got this all under control, or they really don't. So if you have all your chips on the they've got this covered side, I think it's a bad bet at this stage. And so that's why we're having this webinar is to uh, talk with people who have pretty good insights into who the Fed is, how they were founded, how they are organized, what they're thinking currently, and 
really that means we're we're sort of in that speculative mode still because we're trying to figure out, Mike, what's the Fed going to do? Uh, it's not very fundamental, but we do know that fundamentally, when we back up even further, there always has to be a balance between the money you create and the stuff you buy with it. And in this story, the money we create is both currency and it's debt. They both operate like money. Like if I take out a student loan for 50000 and spend that money, that's $50,000 you know, that went out because of credit expansion. So when we look at this story, the world has had the fastest period of credit expansion in the last uh, eight years or so that it's ever had. It has this extraordinary uh, base money creation, largest in all of history by far. It's driven up financial assets like stocks and bonds to ridiculous heights, quite mysteriously left commodities pretty much completely off of that particular run since 2011 and QE3. And so when we put all of that in one spot, all I see is that the claims on real wealth are increasing, and that's both the debt and the currency. And with both of those increasing as fast as they are, I know there has to be a correction at some point, and things have gotten really extreme lately uh, all across the globe, but particularly in, in equity markets, places like that. So what can you do? This is a crazy bubble time. You have to sit back and watch. You have to understand where it comes from in the crash course. I make the case, Mike, that this isn't – We're not dealing with the after effects of a housing bubble that burst in 2007. We've been growing our credit at twice the rate of our income in this story. So total credit market debt compared to GDP. The debt's been growing twice as fast as our income in this story for 45 years. That's what broke in 2008. And it hasn't been able to be fixed because it's just just a dumb model. Hey, we're going to grow our expenses and our expenditures at twice the rate of our income you know, you can't do that as a person, so you can't do it as a nation. So that's what we've been doing, and that's what I think has just gotten to a, a, extraordinary levels right here with what the central banks are now trying to just keep this going a little longer. And we don't have a lot of history to guide us uh, here. We have seen currencies collapse in the past. We've seen economies uh, really struggle. You see that in Venezuela. But there's really nowhere to escape this one truthfully, because it, the whole world is involved in this at this point. It, you know, there's no, it's not like, you know, you were in Austria in 1918 uh, and you could duck over the border and uh, be in a safe country. Where would you go, given that it's really it's the dollar, the yen, the euro have all been uh, principally on this uh, train, China caught up really fast in this story. Where would you go? So with that, I don't have any great answers besides uh, people need to understand the context and then begin to build resilience in their portfolio, financial resilience, but other forms of resilience around social capital, emotional capital, all of the other things that we talk about in Prosper, because I personally don't see a way to get out of this without experiencing a lot of pain economically. We certainly are in uncharted waters. Uh, Now, the Fed has had a bit lower profile since the November elections. Trump has has, uh, decided to stick with Janet Yellen, at least for the time being, and the constant political drama in Washington seems to be dominating even when it comes to investing news. Frankly, the constant obsession over what the FOMC might do at their next meeting uh, had become tedious beyond words, so so we've been Mm -hmm. glad for the respite. However, uh, there will be plenty of attention on this month's meeting where officials are expected to hike rates again. Do you agree with the consensus that two to three more rate hikes are coming in 2017? If they keep hiking, it it seems the Fed will eventually wind up at odds with Trump, who would almost certainly like to avoid holding the bag during the next big economic slowdown. So so what are your thoughts about the Fed during Trump's administration here, Chris, both in the short run and in the longer term? Well, the the Fed is is really just running its own script at this point in time. It's it's pretty independent of who's in the White House, and uh, Trump can try and lean on them a little bit, but he won't lean on them in the way you or I might think he should, which is to, yeah, tightening things up would probably be a wise course of action. But uh, something that I've written about and I've even produced a short video on recently is that this dynamic you're talking about, tightening, is not actually happening in this cycle. Because in 2008, Congress gave the Federal Reserve the right to pay interest on excess reserves that are held by depository institutions at the Fed. So the Fed prints money, and of course that creates lots of excess reserves in the banking system. Then the banks put that back at the Fed, and the Fed pays interest on that. So the last uh, three hikes that we've seen going from basically a range of between zero and a quarter percent on up to the current 1% in quarter increments, what we saw is that each one of those moments on the same day, 
that the Fed allegedly hiked interest rates, they also increased the amount they were going to pay on excess reserves. So now the banks have a choice. Am I going to keep money risk-free at the Fed, or am I going to keep it, you know, lend it to Bank B overnight? And, of course, they increasingly just chose to take the safe, sure money from the Fed. And so this is what's different about this particular story, is that now when the Fed raises rates, not only does it not remove money from the system, but it's actually adding more money to the, to the bank system because it pays interest. $2 trillion held at the Federal Reserve right now will generate, at current rates, $20 billion of interest income to the big banks on a yearly basis. That's, uh, that's adding money. That's not subtracting. So it's totally different. Now, you recently wrote a fascinating piece on your Peak Prosperity site about how the Fed, in your view, is destroying America. You've sort of alluded to some of those uh, reasons, but uh, talk about this, Chris. Why do you believe this to be the case? Because what they're doing is not just printing money, but they're social engineering. They, they have to pick winners and losers. I know it sounds like the Fed prints money and does these crazy, sophisticated things where it buys Treasury at an auction or does a reverse repo and all this fancy name, but really all they're doing is they're printing money and they're handing it out to the market and taking uh, pieces of debt in return for that. So when you really look at that dynamic, the Fed has been the engineer of the largest wealth gap that we've ever seen in all, all of our history at this point in time. It's engineered one of the most, if not soon to be, the most punishing income gaps. It's also purposely driven up the prices of houses, which, if you think about it, isn't actually good for anybody except the very few people who sell and downsize and capture that, that gain. It's not good for first-time home buyers. It's not good for existing homeowners who have to pay higher property taxes and insurance bills and things like that. But the Fed drove this up and created huge income disparities and really drove up the actual true cost of inflation in all the areas, of uh, metropolitan areas, particularly where these uh, new private equity firms like Blackstone came in and scooped, just scooped up lots of properties. So when you look at all of this, what is the Fed really doing? Well, they've locked out the millennial generation pretty handily. They've enabled the federal government to go forward with even more aggressive indebtedness and taking on more debt. They've really encouraged, if not almost forced, corporations to engage in financial engineering because, hey, if you're a CFO, you can borrow 1% and retire dividend yielding stock at 2%. Do that all day long makes total sense. But companies, they've been doing financial engineering, not productivity engineering. So all of these things you can lay at the feet of the Fed. And listen, if they wanted to run six months, maybe 12 months of emergency interest rate cuts back in 2008, early 2009, I would have said, okay. But how long are we into this now, right? Depending on how you count it, we're at least eight years into this thing, maybe nine. And that's a pretty long emergency, don't you think? And all that's happening during this emergency is we're watching those things I just described just get wider and wider and wider. More financialization, less investment, harder starts for students and millennials and other young people coming in, not easier. Uh, Really low business formation because a trillion dollars of interest income didn't go to people who are the traditional savers, the moms, the pops, the dads, grandmas, who then take their interest income, that trillion missing dollars, and use that to help their sons and daughters and granddaughters and grandsons start businesses. So we're seeing all of these effects. And of course, you know, just the the big mystery is that really it's not talked about all that much yet, but it should be. In terms of the metals, Chris, it's been a a decent but unspectacular year, despite uh, what appears to be the ongoing price manipulation schemes of these uh, bullion banks. Uh, What are your thoughts on the gold and silver markets? Well, there I'm going to just deviate slightly into the Bitcoin market. Notice today, I think it's around 2300 or so. It's been gyrating a, a bit. And I know it was higher recently. But just watching how those prices are actually behaving, that to me looks something like a free and fair market, right? So you can actually watch and make sense of uh, the movements in those markets. As you and your listeners really well know, that once the, the leveraged paper market gets wrapped around any market, it's now open to the players who want to control those markets to do what they will. So in my mind, a really important article for everybody to read two weeks ago, roughly, in the Wall Street Journal, we had that article about how the quants, all these people who are just have the math skills who can come in and write the algorithms that now run Wall Street, those algorithms have access to huge amounts of capital. Most of them are really trading at, at millisecond, maybe microsecond speeds, and they're running around doing things in various markets, including the precious metals markets. And I think those have been under basically the direct control of the bullion banks for quite a while, and it's been their own personal piggy bank, if you will. And, and hey, that all makes sense, right? But uh, as you know and as I know, 
those games can't go on forever. And at this point, I'm, I, I kind of, I think it's gold and silver kind of found what feels to me like a base here, hopefully. And I have a strong sense that when this next financial crisis or, or paralysis comes along, that people are going to want safe haven assets at that point. And the safer, the better. That's because I think there's institutional risk, possibly even sovereign risk. Like things could really uh, get hammered once you understand how extraordinary the leverage is in the system and where the debts are distributed and who owes who what. It just, it really doesn't add up well. So if that gets called into question, you know, guess what? Uh, having having precious metals is going to be a, a really important thing to do. And as we've discussed before, you're going to either have them before that moment comes or you probably won't have them after. I, that would be my guess, seeing how quickly those markets can dry up. Your website, Peak Prosperity, focuses on preparedness and, and self-reliant living. You, you can find communities there with interests ranging from investing to living off the grid. Are there any particular topics that members there are focused on at the moment? Uh, what are people interested in these days? Uh, we assume it isn't all Washington, D.C. politics all the time. So, so what are people in your sphere concentrating on these days, Chris? Oh, good question. But we've been talking about uh, a variety of things all across the, the spectrum, really. At this particular juncture, we're not spending nearly as much time on politics as you might think. What we're pretty interested in is where the market's going, uh, what's really happening across uh, certain uh, geopolitical areas, not not U.S. politics. Interestingly, uh, a third and growing area on our website is talking about how how would you how would you simply be in this world today? Like how would we conduct ourselves? How are we living into the story as it unfolds? Because this is these are brand new times. And increasingly, Mike, I'm running into people who get it. They're like, ah, something is off in this story. We know it. Some people understand it. Some just feel it. It doesn't matter. So that's really what a lot of us are talking about at Peak Prosperity now is, is how do we stay focused? How do we stay in the game? How do we live in a way so that we're really enjoying ourselves today, but we're also prepared for tomorrow? And so increasingly, I think it makes sense. This has been a fairly long, slow topping process that we're in right now. And I think there's a sense here that we don't know how much longer this can continue, right? It's just tiring to be on alert all the time. Uh, so what we're talking about is how not to be on alert all the time, yet be prepared at the same time, if that makes any sense. Well, as we begin to wrap up here, and before we get into some more of those details on your upcoming webinar, give us your thoughts on, on this period of calm before the storm that we appear to be in right now. Many were calling for a tumultuous year in 2017, coming off of the chaotic year we had in 2016 with Brexit and the crazy U.S. election and so forth. But but to this point, it hasn't really materialized. Uh, so what is it going to be that throws us off course, derails this historic rise in equities and, and changes the economic landscape and then ultimately gets precious metals back into the consciousness of the investing public, Chris? Well, Mike, a lot of things could do it, of course, but what will do it, it's hard to say. This is a, a complex system. You know, after the fact, people will point back and say, oh, is that, it was when the German finance minister said that or something, right? But, you know, the, we'll, we'll try and identify, but uh, we have giant bubbles at this point in time. Nobody knows when bubbles are going to burst, and uh, they always do it in a surprising way. It's kind of Part of their definitions. I've been thinking that this can't go on much longer for a while, and it has, so I'm adjusting accordingly and, and understanding, yeah, they've really got a pretty good sense of control on the system, but look how much it cost us. Again, rewind, I think the most important information people can have is a trillion dollars had to be put into the system to basically hold everything elevated. Slight gains, but really, honestly, mostly just bumping along. And that's a really astonishing situation. I like to follow what the central bankers are doing, not what they're saying. They're saying everything's great, but they're doing emergency measures in the highest amounts ever. So uh, given all of that, you know, I think it just makes a lot of sense for individuals to take action based on that, to make themselves prepared, make themselves more resilient, and lots of things people can do. And by the way, almost all of these things that we would recommend, uh, if not all of them, are going to make your life better today people will not look back on getting ready in the way we suggest and say, I shouldn't have gotten in shape. I probably shouldn't have saved so much money. It's too bad I have uh, you know, this functioning house. Nobody's, nobody's going to say that. So I think this calm before the storm is the time that we use as the gift that it is. It's still very easy, relatively speaking, to uh, take whatever steps you want to take. And becoming prepared while things are really unraveling is, is a bad strategy. It's hard to be efficient. It's hard to be calm. It's hard to be rational 
uh, if you're in the middle of all of that when it happens. So that's been our advice. It's been our advice for a while. It hasn't really changed. And I honestly, I don't know how much longer this can go on. It's surprised me every month of the way so far. Yeah, you got to fight that complacency. And then also, uh, yeah, like you, like you mentioned, when things are unraveling, that's not one you want to be just now starting to think about what you're going to do in those situations. Uh, well, Chris, thanks so much for your time and your wonderful insights. Now, now we've touched on it a bit already, but but talk about this upcoming webinar, uh, when it is, who's involved, and then share a little bit more about what you'll be discussing, and then, of course, how people can get registered for that, because it will undoubtedly be very worthwhile and informative. Give us the info there, if you would. Sure. So the structure is it's a webinar. It's about two and a half hours long. We have three special guests on there. Each one of those guests is going to speak for a period of time, and also there will be an opportunity for live Q&A uh, for the participants who've registered for this webinar. Uh, the cost is $50, and the three guests we have are, are G. Edward Griffin. He wrote the book on the Federal Reserve, uh, so he's the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, which I'm sure many of your listeners have read. And uh, we've got David Stockman, uh, former head of the Office of Management and Budget under Reagan, uh, was a U.S. representative and a pretty frequent commentator on the macro conditions in the markets. He's going to be helping us understand those conditions. Also, what's happening in Washington, D.C., because the politics here are probably going to shape Fed policy as they have for a while. Will the Trump tax uh, cuts go through? What's the infrastructure plan looking like? So we're counting on David for that. And then Axel Merck, he's the person who knows more Federal Reserve officials than anybody else I know. So both current and former, he just came back from a whole uh, two- or three-day event where I think there were 20 Fed officials at, so he got to talk with them and sort of read the tea leaves and read the body language, so hopefully he'll be giving us some insights into what comes next. Again, so this is on June 7th, it's at noon, and it's going to be a live webinar, so people who signed up for that also will be able to download and watch that later. We've got a link to the webinar registration page from this podcast page on our site, and, and we urge people to sign up for that. It's, it's a truly great lineup of participants, and it should be fantastic. Well, excellent stuff as always, Chris. It's been great to talk with you again, and thanks for being so generous with your time today. Much success with the upcoming webinar, continued success with the book, and I, I hope you enjoy your summer, and I look forward to catching up with you later this year. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you so much. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Dr. Chris Martinson of PeakProsperity.com and co-author of the book Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. Check out the site for information on that, as well as next week's webinar on the end of money, which is June 7th at 12 noon Eastern time. Just go to PeakProsperity.com slash webinar for more information. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.